Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to this special medical center hour on an off day of the week, a Monday. Um, I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, which produces the weekly medical center hour. We will have another program um, this week on our regular Wednesday time, and I'll announce that at the end of the hour. Um, our program today, Bearing Witness, Veterans Portraits, Veterans Words, um, beginning in 2006, painter and printmaker Daniel Heyman worked with a human rights lawyer as her team took testimony from victims of political torture in Iraq and from U.S. military personnel who had been sexually assaulted. The artist's portraits of those who testified included not only head and shoulders images, but inscribed in the surrounding space, their often harrowing narratives. Late last fall, an interesting partnership of programs brought Daniel Heyman to UVA, the Department of Studio Art, the Human Rights Program of the Law School, and the University-wide Institute for Practical Ethics and Public Life not only sponsored his exhibit about political torture, bearing witness, but also brokered some very rich, very interesting conversations among artists, human rights lawyers, policy wonks, ethicists, and health professionals who care for wartime immigrants and refugees. Indeed, the exchange was so bright and engaging, and Daniel was so obliging as a conversation starter that we invited him back this time to focus on his portraits of returning veterans. So he's here with us this week, again, as the guest of Studio Art, the Law School's Human Rights Program, the Institute for Practical Ethics and Public Life, and this time also the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. This Medical Center Hour features Daniel Heyman discussing his veterans' portraits, portraits which dramatically disclose that the faces and stories of soldiers and Marines returning to civilian life are often scarred by experiences beyond field combat. And as those of us in healthcare know, what happens to a person in life more often than not registers in the body, the psyche, the spirit, and overall in the health of that individual and the health of those surrounding him or her. So what can we discern from Daniel Heyman's images and narratives? What can we learn about veterans' service, wounds, strengths, and needs, and how do we respond? Daniel Heyman's images are striking, the veterans' stories, in their own words, hard to bear. Sometimes you'll want to turn away, to shield yourself from what hurt them, what hurts you. But part of the work of the health professional, of all of us really, is to bear witness to the suffering of our fellow beings, to see the wounds and hear the words. And here, the artist for whom this witnessing is also hard can be an important mediator. Daniel Heyman says this about his work, quote, I am an artist and my work is about seeing. Through these encounters, I hope to honor these persons' dignity and humanity and to give voice to voices the public has not had a chance to hear. I hope that the portraits will bring you not into a state of depression because the tales told within are deeply disturbing but to a sense of empathy and shared humanity. Out of this effort, the artists and ours, and out of the great courage and spirit of these veterans, we can appreciate, I think, in the words of the poet W.B. Yeats, that a terrible beauty is born. We welcome today Daniel Heyman, a Philadelphia artist whose work is widely exhibited and who teaches in several highly respected art programs at Princeton University, Rhode Island School of Design, University of the Arts, and the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. We also welcome today Jeffrey Barth, the John Edward Fowler Professor of Clinical Psychology and Head of the Neurocognitive Studies Section of the Department of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Science Studies. Besides working with veterans with traumatic brain injury and PTSD, Jeff is one of the medical school's point persons on a new initiative with the Department of Veterans Affairs to bring the nation's medical schools into an effort to provide our veterans and their families with better care. And thanks again to our quartet of co-sponsors um, for this event. And now, Daniel Heyman and Jeffrey Barth. Thank you. 
Thank you, Marcia and Dean and Dina and everybody else at the University of Virginia for bringing me back. It's an incredible pleasure and honor. And um, not to be too much of an artist, but can we um, can we bring the lights down? Thank you. So, um, I, and I hope I don't repeat too much of what I said here in the fall. I haven't got that much to say. Uh, so if I do, please excuse me. Before I begin this talk, I want to pose a question uh, to keep in mind. Where is the disease here? Is it the PTSD suffered by a returning veteran who has, been, who has seen or participated or been victim to too much violence while serving in the military? Or is it the culture of the military and the larger society that takes vulnerable young people and trains them to be killing machines for the good of their country, as one soldier put it recently before a congressional hearing? Okay. So, this is my new graphic. Um, I'm going to pose some rhetorical questions just to open things up. How can an artist respond to a nationally, uh, to a national crisis that is rarely acknowledged? And up here are, um, let's see, yes, no. um, these are two of the uh, plaintiffs in the case about um, uh, military sexual assault. This is uh, Corey Choka, oh, yeah, excuse me, Corey Choka on the left, and um, Penyon Bersiakis. Um, Brent Zickets, all right. Um, does an artist have a right, maybe even an obligation, to participate in the moral, ethical, and intellectual debates of his or her age? And this is Rick Tringle, survivor of MSC, which is military sexual trauma, uh, who speaks very eloquently about his case on YouTube, should you be interested. And I, I, um, I had a, a sheet of kind of statistics and stuff that's been handed out, so I'm just going to um, very quickly read it, but it's just a kind of take home to think about. Sexual trauma in the military reserves and the National Guard. And I'll just read a few of them. 27% of, uh, of the men of men have experienced military sexual trauma. 60% of the women of women have experienced military sexual trauma. 3.5% of men have experienced military sexual assault, and 23% of women have experienced military sexual assault. 11% of women in the services have experienced rape, and 1.2% of the men services have experienced rape. Um, some more statistics, you can read them uh, and the takeaway. The most uh, kind of interesting one might be this one on the bottom. Factors that increase risk of sexual assault for active duty females include the presence of officers who condone or allow sexual harassment and unwanted sexual attention. On their, in their services, this is just a list of sources where the statistics came from. Wouldn't it be prudent not simply to treat those who come back with PTSD, but to treat the diseased culture, the diseased culture that trains men to be hyper-aggressive in the first place? The big question is not rhetorical. As doctors who are trained to treat individual patients, can you look at a rape survivor or victim as a symptom of a larger diseased organism. And that's something I've never asked because I really have art students in front of me. But it's a really interesting question that I started to think about when I was thinking about coming here. OK. Um, and I, I just wanted to bring in um, uh, some other artists who have worked with, um, uh, who I think whose work is really, really interesting, who have worked with veterans. Uh, the first one is Jen Carradine. She's a, a photographer in New York, and actually she's all over the country at any particular time. She's been working for the past four or five years with um, veterans from the Iraqi War, and I think also the Persian Gulf War, although I'm not sure. And what she does was, is she spends um, a lot of time with a particular veteran and then um, over several months, she'll go and visit and spend a day with them uh, several times and really get to know them and then kind of hone in and, and with the veteran and talking about a particular nightmare or dream or current nightmare or dream that they have about their service when they were in the armed services. And then she works with them to recreate that dream where they live here in the United States with their family members playing roles 
from the dream. It's a really interesting uh, idea, and the work is incredibly powerful. Um, there was a large article in the Times about it about a year ago. Uh, so here's one. Here's another one. They're mysterious. They're kind of mysterious. Um, Aaron Toole. Aaron Toole is another uh, artist who works with veteran issues. Aaron Toole is a veteran from the first Gulf War. He lives in San Francisco or in Berkeley, I think, and is a potter. And um, when he returned from the war, he got an MFA in uh, ceramics and has made over 7,000 cups exactly the same size on which he stamps or prints different kinds of medical um, military insignia. So there might be um, badges or rank kind of symbols, or there might be pictures of people in the military, or there might be the kinds of, uh, like Tim O'Brien's, things they took with them or things they carried, um, pinups and um, other kinds of personal things that you might find on a soldier. And he lines them up in different exhibitions, either in large rows or um, individually. And for him, each one of these cups represents a soldier. And then, um, unfortunately, I don't have access to the internet, I don't think, here. But um, then he makes these videos, which I think are the most interesting part of the project, where he lines these cups up on a shelf and he shoots at them. And the video is just the cups being shot, one after the other. And that's a really powerful piece to, um, to see in an art gallery. And they come from the first-hand experience of him having been in the army. And he's also incredibly eloquent and articulate about his work. The third art artist I wanted to um, bring to light is uh, um, Damien Cody, who's also a, a veteran. He's a um, veteran from the Marines. He was also a student, a graduate student of mine at the Rhode Island School of Design in printmaking, which he went to after he left the Marines. Um, and I brought uh, in, you can come and take a look at it, I brought in kind of his project the, f the first semester he was in graduate school, he was, um, he started doing this incredible manual, um, FM 9-26, otherwise stated the masculine gender, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, this is a kind of a takeoff, Damien's takeoff on how to survive manuals that he received in boot camp and other uh, parts of his military service time, and um, but it's got a twist from real experience. And so um, I brought it in so that if you want to come and take a look at it later, um, you certainly can. This is the cover. Here's one that says, Preparing Edible Insects. Um, all of the text comes from actual manuals, and all of the images come from Damien's ideas of what it would actually be like. Say, for example, you were lost on the road between um, Mosul and Baghdad, and you've just been blown up, and you were trying to live off insects, so that, that's kind of where the pictures come from. Um, hard shelled insects have parasites, remove wings and legs, drop, drop worms into potable water for at least 30 minutes, they will naturally purge themselves, eat raw carts. That was a page from this manual. And here's another one The psychological will to survive. You must have a positive mental attitude, overcome boredom and loneliness. It can lead to insanity. Remember, the sky is still blue. And here there's a soldier trying to play some kind of soccer with a legless soldier. Uh, looks like he's wrapped up his pants. OK, so, um, and I have a, and I'll talk about it later, but I have a portrait that I did of Damien after he graduated from school over on the right. So just as a kind of um, introduction to myself as an artist, because uh, um, I don't recognize most of you, so that's good. I just wanted to very briefly introduce you to the three series I did before this series with the veterans. Um, <coughs> this first painting is um, a painting it took me about two years. I did in the mid to late 90s in Philadelphia. And the subject um, was the murder of a teenager by a group of teenagers who didn't know him, who had decided on a Monday, then on Friday, they would take their bats down to another section of town, find somebody to beat up. And it resulted in the death of a, of a young guy named Eddie Pollock. And um, I don't want to go into it too much, but um, I spent uh, about two years making a kind of my own um, history painting of it. And here's a close up of um, 
this is a, a church in Philadelphia called St. Cecilia's where Eddie Pollock had been a, an altar boy when he was 12. He was murdered on the steps here by a group of teenagers represented by this man who batted his head against the, the steps. And anyway, it's very complicated. That was a series. I worked on that kind of series for about five or six years. Um, this was a series, uh, the Marshall alluded to, that I started in 2005. I've been working with 2006. I've been working on the issue of torture by Americans at Abu Ghraib um, for a while when I had the very fortunate luck to, um, to meet Susan Burke, who was a, a human rights lawyer who was defending, um, or not defending, she was prosecuting two American um, military contractors on behalf of torture survivors from Abu Ghraib. And this was a, kind of a, a typical picture at the time, and I'll just read it to you. Um, this is a, a man who's, uh, oopsie, sorry, um, who's uh, sitting and talking to his lawyers as they take down his testimony. It wasn't a deposition, it was just an initial um, investigative kind of interview. Um, and we met him in Istanbul in a hotel room. Every night, Grainer mistreated us. Now, Grainer was, is notorious, but if you don't know, Grainer was one of the American soldiers who was in charge at night of the um, heart, what was called the hard site at Abu Ghraib, which was one of the wings in the prison, which is enormous, an enormous prison. Every night, Grainer mistreated us, different positions to give us pain very fast. When we cried, he was happy. This is the music I like. One night, they put blankets over the cell bars. This was the night the prisoner was killed. I was made to stand all night facing the cloth. I'm hearing, I thought, a prisoner being forced to drink from a toilet like drowning. I could not breathe. I am. I thought, my time is near. The prisoner's noise stopped. And um, I don't know if it sounds like waterboarding is what he was listening to. This is another piece from, uh, from around the same time, I think in 2007, where I took the testimony of a woman who didn't let me in to uh, listen to her um, give the testimony with the Burke lawyers, uh, but later was kidnapped, raped, and murdered when she got back to um, Iraq. And at that point, her family gave me permission to use her testimony, and I had an exhibition and took her testimony and printed it on the floor of the gallery so that if you came in to see the artwork that I had up on the walls all around, you had to kind of have a physical contact with her testimony, which was on the floor. And, um, uh, you know, for all sorts of metaphorical reasons. And um, I think the last series I'm going to show you a little bit from is um, uh, the Burke lawyers also prosecuted a case against Blackwater, which changed his name, I think, to the Z, is how you pronounce it. And um, that's a military contractor company, and they were involved in a massacre in Baghdad at Nisar Square in September of 2007. And a few weeks after the massacre, um, I traveled twice to Istanbul uh -huh. with the lawyers to hear testimony from some of the people that were wounded in that massacre. And I'll just read you this guy's testimony. He was on his way to breakfast when it, when it occurred. I wanted to have breakfast. During the shooting, I hit down by the gas pedal. Can you read it? Front, rear side windows all shot out. The headrest was full of bullets. I saw a mother carrying her dead child. I wish I did not see that. I was shot by 22 bullets. At the time that he told us that, that he stood up and he pulled up his pants and he had all these wounds in a leg. I mean, you know, from bullets. It was impressive. I lost the use of one eye. I cannot walk. The vice ambassador said she was sorry. I said I didn't want to hear her apology. I wanted my eye. I cannot work. And then this, is, um, this case is finished and never went to trial, um, but was settled. And at the time of doing this portrait, um, he, he went on here and said something that this was the only time in all of the time I worked with the lawyers where they came over and they looked at me and I looked like, they said, well, you can't put that down in your book. And I said, why not? And I said, well, because it's very violent. What he's expressing is very, very violent and we'll never be able to bring him into the United States as a witness if um, the opposition brings up this violent uh, sentiment because he will be seen as a threat to the United States. But now that the the case has dropped, um, I can tell you what he said. He said um, he had been wounded in his eye, and his, his eye was, he was losing the use of his eye. And he said, um, 
I didn't want to, he was brought into the, uh, to the embassy and offered money for his wounds. $2,000, I think, was what the U.S. was offering people that were hurting this massacre. And um, he's, he didn't need the money. He said, I don't want your money. What I want to do is go down the street with a rifle and shoot every American I see in the eye. So, of course, I had to take that out. Um, it was understandable. This is a, um, that book that's stretched out. It's part of a book that I have. And this is the last one that I'll show you. This was a version of it was, was up here um, at the McIntyre um, Art Department last fall. And this is kind of a metaphorical piece on the war, and I don't really want to go into it because we're going to talk about vets. So with the, um, the veterans, I've worked with three different, um, three different times I've worked with veterans, uh, and I hope to work with more of them. The first time was with um, two men that were homeless and were living in a homeless shelter, not a homeless shelter, but a house that the VA um, owned in Philadelphia and would let homeless veterans live in for six months as they tried to find um, housing. And one of them got there, they both had been living in a homeless shelter before they got there. Um, <clears throat> and they're very different, I'll show you that work. And then. Um, um, an individual veteran that came to me was David Cody. If I showed you his work, and I'm going to show you my portrait of him. And then um, again with the Burke, uh, the Burke lawyers, I um, was able to meet and interview um, women who were survivors of military sexual assault um, and military sexual trauma. And those cases are still ongoing. So this is the first um, that I'll show you. This is Lonnie Bowman, and. Um, it's one of the only works that in the last couple of years that has no writing on it, or very little, which is his Bonnie Bowen, um, July 6, 2009. And I think it's because he had so many incredible stories and so much personality. I didn't know where to start, so I didn't put it in. He grew up in South Jersey in a very rural community. He told me all about hunting, um, uh, what are those big turtles? Snapping turtles in ponds. And as a kid, and then he, um, he signed up for the army uh, during the Vietnam War and was sent to the Philippines. This was very early when I said, oh, how was the Philippines? Ah, Philippines was great. I bought my first wife in the Philippines. <laughs> so uh, I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> Nobody's ever said that to me before. So he bought his first wife in the Philippines. I said, how? wow. He said, yeah, I think we had a baby, but I'm not really sure because I was transferred to Vietnam and I never, you know, I never heard from her again. Whatever. So then he was in the he was on two tours of duty in Vietnam, and um, he said in his on his base or in his unit um, he was one of only two African Americans, and um, with several hundred white Americans, and that uh, because he was African American, um, the, his immediate commanders kind of figured he knew a lot about drugs, so he was basically trained to smuggle drugs into the base for the American soldiers. And he did that for a while, and since he was very successful at doing that, then, he's, then he was used by the Americans to smuggle Russian um, Kalashnikovs into the base. Because Russian Kalashnikovs, if you know anything about, about military weapons, they're extremely um, useful weapons. They're, very, very, they're like the VW bug. You know, they're very easy to repair. They're really successful in guerrilla war and stuff like that. And, and the Americans didn't have them, of course. They couldn't just go to the Russians and buy them. So he would smuggle them in. And then when um, somehow the politics of the particular base turned, um, they turned on him and court-martialed him. And he had a dishonorable discharge for having smuggled in drugs and, and rifles, which might end up being why he ended up being um, isolated and, and homeless. But you know who knows? That was a long time ago. No responsibility there. Um, then this one, I'll read you what I wrote about Tony, um, Tony Bailey. Um, uh, Tony Bailey was also homeless, and he never wanted to tell me how he got homeless or why he was homeless. Uh, so, and he didn't really tell me all that was interesting, all that much stuff that was interesting. So I wrote something about him, <clears throat> and it kind of explains my sculpture pieces of which were in something uh, on display here in the fall. Tony is a very, very different from Lonnie, but no less rich in history. 
Early on, I decided that I wanted to make Tony's image some kind of house, some kind of shelter. Tony was, after all, a man who had lost his home, was living in a homeless shelter before he found his way to his VA facility. I call it Tony's shelter, but I could just as easily have called it, how do we construct a homeless vet? This structure is an amalgamation of, Im of images printed from etchings onto wood, assembled into a kind of house or shelter. At the summit is a portrait of Tony Bailey, a homeless veteran who lives temporarily in North Philadelphia, in North Philadelphia row, row House, owned by the Veterans Administration. I drew Tony's portrait in this home as he recounted in his home, as he in that one, as he recounted stories from his life, one or two of which is included in the image. And the only um, real I won't read the text, but there is text up there, and the only real text is about um, how when he first got back. Uh, from his service, he had a series of jobs, none of which stuck, he kind of kept getting um, laid off, and then he eventually got a job with Amtrak, where he worked for six years on the tracks, and then, um, which he hated because, he said he hated it because in the snow you couldn't hear the trains coming, and he was very scared of it, and he had seen um, another Amtrak worker not hear a train coming and be killed in, in the after. Um, <clears throat> Below the portrait are three levels. The roof level presents a pair of menacing bald eagles. One step down is a, bo is a box, the body of the house with two sides showing eagles perched on branches, a third showing a bizarrely sexualized eagle grasping a gun of flowers. The fourth side shows the portrait of a bearded man surrounded by a poem. I think I have a picture of that. Surrounded by a poem printed backwards, referring to testimony given to me by a torture victim from Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. The bottom level, below a bare plywood floor, are repeated images of a diving eagle, as well as an initial image of, um, of a sitting bald eagle. The walls of the last level fold in and out. The bald eagle, or our American bald eagle, the icon, is a bird of prey the top of its food chain, our symbol of national pride and strength, and perhaps misunderstood as preying on foreign enemies rather than preying on the vulnerable, young, and economically stressed. The dignity of Tony himself, and he sits in for all those like him, rises above this somehow in the end, as human dignity is something internal, not something doled out by military commanders. I want these images to provoke questions about patriotism, service, heroism, and the realities of life as a veteran, as well as the health issues raised and the prevalence of homelessness, obviously. Where is the honor when the government asks its citizens to commit violence at its service, and why are those who serve at risk so at risk for homelessness, which I think we all can consider a health issue. And then, um, uh, second to last, uh, Damien Cody, who I've introduced through his work, and um, I think it's really interesting a testimony, so I'm going to read it to you, and I'm doing fine on time. So, um, this is some of the testimony that he has. During the year, there was one suicide. He was in. He went to. Um, he's from Western Massachusetts. He went to boot camp, I think even in Virginia, and then he was shipped to Guantanamo Bay, where he served as a tower guard for 15 months, I think. During the year there, there was one suicide while I was there. I didn't know him really, he was part of a small group. We were just working and working, and there was no time to get to know anyone. It wasn't even officially announced. Not too long after hearing about that, I was working in the armory, and you know, the armory is where they could store the weapons, the ammunition for the base. And they brought in, the captain brought in a rifle from the NIS, that's the Naval Investigation Services, or something like that, I'm not sure, in the NES. And there was a TV show, there was a TV show about it a couple of years ago. Anyway, the officer brought in the rifle to the armory along with the black and white photographs, some, sh some photos. It was a strange, morbid kind of thing, because I didn't ask to see the photos. So I don't know if it's because he wanted to show them to me, or he thought I would want to see them. Well, the photos were the black and white photos of the guy in place after he shot himself on the toilet, and that's the gun. He brought in the gun, and he brought in the photograph, really, um, in the photograph, really a rifle, no, it was an M16, a big difference. The rifle was wrapped in butcher paper. The rifle was still clogged up and never cleaned in a way, in any way. So I was given the rifle to clean, to clean it out. The coagulated blood, it took over two days. <coughs> 
and then it just got reissued to the next recruit. Did you ever tell the recruit what happened to the rifle? No, I never did. If there was someone, a Cuban, who was trying to escape over the minefields, and I think these were the biggest minefields in the world between Cuba, the Cuban side and the American side, get it together. They were lucky to make it through the mines and also the Cuban guards. If they were lucky enough, they would be handed, handcuffed and brought in for interrogation by the Americans. This happened all the time. No shooting ever happened between the Americans and the Cubans while I was there that I know of. The mines were everywhere. Sometimes when a deer on our side or a cow on their side hit the mines the wrong way, you could just see this explosion out of nowhere. I was there for six months, and then this new guy became my roommate. And one day I woke up and noticed that his face was, face was completely swollen and tenderized like meat. One of his eyes was shut completely, swollen shut. I remember asking him what happened, and without so many words, he said he was initiated. He was welcome to Guantanamo Bay. At the end of the year, I went to Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. At Lejeune, the Marines and the fleet give a lot of respect to the Marines who had gone to Guantanamo. Within a year, there was talk of the mandatory anthrax shot for all the combat troops. I grew very skeptical of the benefits compared to the risks of taking the six shot series. At first, there were 100 guys out of the battalion of 1,000 who said they didn't want to take it. The authority figures threatened and persuaded them, and then there was just me. It boiled down to me not wanting to take, to take the shots. After being asked over and over, I stuck to my guns. I was given seven days in corrective custody. <coughs> it's a humiliating form of boot camp where we spent time breaking stones with a steel sledge. Were the stones ever used for something? That's, that was me. No, it was just a pile of rocks. I lost pay but not rank. About six months later, I was ordered again to take the shots, and again I refused. At the time, we were in Korea, and my punishment was a loss of rank and a month's pay and restriction to the base, to the camouflage uniform, to a whole lot of extra duties. Back in Camp Lejeune, about six months later, I was ordered to get the shot again and then sent to the battalion level for a court martial when I refused again. The sentence this time uh, was time in the brig. I pleaded for no brig time. Instead, I got the maximum restriction, 60 days, two months of no pay, and lost all of my rank. I was brought down to a private. At the time, people were getting the Gulf War syndrome and even people who never went to the Gulf. Some people who stayed stateside also came down with Gulf War syndrome, and the only correlation was that they had had the anthrax shots. I refused a fourth time and was about to go for my punishment, which would have been dishonorable discharge, a federal offense. But they decided, after looking at all of the punishment, that I had done my time. And then he was dismissed from the army. And the last, um, the last series, and I'll quickly show the series and then come back to this one. Uh, these were on view at the law school library. Um, let's go back. Um, are the survivors of military sexual assault um, that I have um, met through the, through the law firm that's in DC, but I have gone around the country to find them. So this is um, Corey Choka and I went last summer to, um, to Ohio to interview her. And um, uh, it's not very long and I'm gonna read her whole testimony too. Corey Choka, born July 23rd, 1985, Xenia, Ohio. Interviewed August 30th, 2011. <clears throat> I joined the Coast Guard in August 2005. I always knew I would be in the military doing good service and being so proud. My sister was already in the Navy. I was going to join the Navy, but there was a six month waiting list, so I went to the Coast Guard and then had to wait a month to gain weight. I was around 92, but I had to be 102 pounds or above. Chorus Teeny. I was stationed at Saginaw River. Saginaw River, Michigan, the end of October. I loved the Coast Guard, I loved boot camp. I was captain of ceremonial detain and a squad leader in boot camp. When I arrived at my station, I was the only female in my section, and that's the big problem with women in the military. Um, even wearing the same uniform as the men, I stood out. The base was one building, and the top side had sleeping quarters, <coughs> and mine had a door. It was like living in a house together, but more like a prison. At first, my attacker poses my friend, my Coast Guard team member, and he turned out to be the devil. He would make comments, come on, come on to me. 
He said he was the only one who could sign my quals, which are qualifying exam papers. He said if anyone else did, he would rip them up. He was a third class petty officer. He was the OD officer of the day. He would follow me around the station, always touching me in some kind of way, like a dog urinating on his territory. During a knot tying drill, a knot tying drill, I forgot a knot, and he spit in my face in front of everybody. Jones and his supervisor would blow cigar smoke in my face. When he would scream at me, bitch, whore, piece of shit female, at the top of his lungs, a quarter inch from my face, I would squint because I knew that he would spit on my face. My car was in my only sanctuary because he didn't have the keys to it. He would drink on duty and un unlock my door at night, and he would touch himself and stand over me, and I would pretend to be asleep. I kept my knife open under my pillow. After work, he came into my birthing with an erection, and he grabbed my hand and tried to make me touch him, and I pushed him, and he hit me in the face. I went to the ER, and I needed his permission to go off base to get there. One month later, I needed keys for a duty, and he had them in his birthing, and he taunted me to go in and get them, and he held them in his hand. And when I took them and turned around, he grabbed my hair bun and pulled me into his birthing and raped me and hit me in the face. Anytime I asked why or pray, it made me shut up, and that's um, sick. A week or two afterwards, I went to the ER with a friend of his. I couldn't say anything. My chief, my senior chief, wouldn't investigate until the ICE symposium was over three weeks later. And um, uh, just to paraphrase, she she was at this um, Coast Guard base, and uh, they were preparing a big ICE symposium, and reporting the rape would have gotten in the way. Okay, so that's that's all I have to say, except for one last thing. This is Jenny, Jessica Kenyon, another um, survivor of Penny Adam. Or sickness, kind of see well a mile here, and this is um, this is Gary Nolan, who's a whose daughter uh, signed up for the military, went to boot camp, was raped in boot camp, and then raped uh, in her first assignment again, and um, then committed suicide before her first return home. <clears throat> so this is my last my last thoughts here. I'm not a physician, but it seems to me that at least this much is clear. If you want to staunch the bleeding, you must start, first stop the wounding. We can focus on treating one vet with PTSD at a time, or we can focus on changing the culture of violence that pervades so much of our society and is given free reign within the military <laughs> under the rubric of patriotism. I posit that the belief in violence as a method for solving problems, and that essentially is what the military is, is where the disease is located, and it is a belief that produces so many, many wounded people who are um, what we see as the victims. So that's all I have to say. But um, one last comment, and I, I meant to mention it, is that um, uh, all of these, the women that came back from the sexual assault uh, traumas, um, have been diagnosed. I think of the you know the ones that I talked to have been diagnosed with PTSD, and and another major health problem, and I don't know if it's a diagnosis, you all know that, but the idea is isolation, and the isolation that they feel in their communities and their families when they come back, so. Okay, I'll turn over to Jeff. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. What a poignant set of stories to, to tell us. And um, your last comments uh, regarding where we need to really begin and, uh, and stop some of the mayhem, um, I'm not exactly sure how we can deal with that other than talking about it here uh, in these kinds of forums. And I really appreciate you uh, uh, speaking to that issue, and I hope we will continue to do that as well. Uh, for myself, and for I think most of the folks in this room, we probably have to take a little more micro view or a little closer <laughs> view to what we can really do and how we can relate to this problem. Um, and I think it's, it's become pretty clear that we have a new responsibility here 
at the University of Virginia and at any other medical school and medical center uh, around the country. Um, and uh, that's, that's the uh, part of our new dean's initiative uh, here to treat our, our uh, returning uh, military and their families. This comes from the White House, a, in fact a, a partnership between the White House and our uh, uh, medical schools through, uh, around the country. And so we're, we're committed to beginning that process, but it's something new for um, most of us here in these medical uh, uh, facilities. We have not been used to finding people coming back with the, the same kind of trauma that you're talking about. And I see, uh, I have some psychologists in the audience here and psychiatrists, and I think they're probably the folks that have been most used to dealing with this sort of thing. But these folks are coming into all aspects of medicine here. They're getting treatment in all of our clinics. And every one of our clinics needs to understand not only these kinds of stories, but, but and then this is the tip, and I think a, a very sharp tip of this iceberg. Uh, but what we uh, deal with on a daily basis, at least, is the post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress disorders uh, that are happening with these folks, the homelessness that you mentioned earlier as well, uh, the lack of being able to be in any kind of rewarding uh, vocation, family relationships get destroyed in this process, um, and we need to be sensitive to those things. It's the emotional trauma. Uh, that we need to pay attention to, and it's kind of unique, except in psychiatry, to the medical center. So one of the things I would urge is that, that all, all of us in medicine consider, and in the health care professions consider, um, how we can relate to these, uh, these individuals with this kind of emotional trauma. Um, remembering that when you get someone coming back with any kind of emotional trauma and, and the more traditional post-traumatic stress disorders, you likely are going to have many more complications to this. The one that's uh, nearest and dearest to my heart is uh, uh, mild and moderate head injury, sometimes severe head injury that have uh, uh, in fact recovered to some degree. Um, these mild head injuries, they may sound like very little. But most of these uh, returning service people have been exposed to multiple uh, concussive and co subconcussive blows. What does this do? It, it in fact impairs cognitive function um, and uh, um, exacerbates the emotional um, problems as well. And then, as you well point out, there's the complication of the um, culture of war. These are folks who came from normal lives get brought into the military, they're taught a culture uh, that's a survival culture, um, and then they come back and have to immediately come back into a, uh, a, a culture that's quite different. Uh, Dr. Neidifer, who's here in the audience, can maybe speak to this uh, issue better than I, but it's not too dissimilar from sports folks. Uh, we have uh, individuals, and, and they, of course, get these uh, mild concussions and that sort of thing on a, uh, on a sometimes weekly basis. Um, but they, uh, they are taught a culture of aggression. And uh, when they get ready to retire, or they just come back from the weekend of playing and come back into real life, uh, there's a whole new set of rules. And, and uh, the, that aggression worked very well on the, uh, on the battlefield and the, on the sports uh, arena fields uh, does not translate well uh, into coming back into normal life. It destroys families and so on. So for us as, as, um, as healthcare professionals, I would just uh, recommend that you take a book out of or a page out of the book of uh, psychiatry and psychology and think about when you see these uh, individuals to first listen, take the time to really listen, to get some understanding. It won't be an in-depth understanding, I'm afraid, in most of our clinics, but some type of understanding of the kinds of trauma they're going through, the uh, emotional return to uh, their uh, work here in the uh, United States and their families. 
um, also empathize with that. And recognize that the treatment really is to own those things, to help this person own them, find the right people to help them then desensitize from those issues and reintegrate the, the culture that we have here in the United States back uh, into their lives. Um, so I, I want to stop uh, there and uh, uh, see if we can't uh, get some questions. If Daniel, if you'll come on up here again and uh, discuss this. I, I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Nidefer in the audience here. In the, in the, uh, yeah, there you go, Don. Uh, Don is the executive director of the Virginia uh, of the uh, Virginia NeuroCare, which is part of the Defense and Veterans Brain Injury Center. Um, and he, uh, uh, he has a, a, a fairly unique way of uh, looking at treating post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, seeing it as a, a, a change in culture uh, that involves, um, in war, being uh, taught to react first, feel second, and think third. And when you get back into uh, our everyday <laughs> lives here, uh, it's just about the opposite. It's to think first, feel second, and react uh, third. So uh, again, maybe you'll uh, help us do that uh, and talk about that a little bit. And, and it looks like we've got a question right, right ahead here. Who's I'm, I'm Dean Das. I teach in the studio art department here at UVA. Tell, tell, say more about the White House. Who, who said what? what? What's your directive? <laughs> it's, uh, it's not my directive as such, but um, apparently um, Michelle Obama uh, came to Richmond, uh, and this was maybe, I'm going to guess about a month or so ago, and she met with, she uh, uh, asked people to gather medical school, uh, uh, deans of medical schools, and then presented the case that uh, we have returning veterans who have very serious problems and she wanted to get the uh, AAMC involved in spreading the word that this is a group we need to really focus on and try to learn their problems and how to deal with them. So it comes uh, from Michelle Obama directly uh, to that group. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. My name is Don Knight. I appreciate the introduction, Jeff. And uh, I, I do work with the uh, Defense and Medical Brain Injury Center, and we have here in Charlottesville a, a residence, a facility that actually does treat uh, both traumatic brain injury as well as post-traumatic stress disorder for active duty military. We're very privileged to have Dr. Barth and actually Dr. Evans beside me consulting and working with us. So we appreciate that very much. I want to thank you very much, Daniel, for your work and particularly for raising the level of awareness. I think that that is what I see more than anything else is that we need to educate the people in the U.S. Um, that really these people are among us. I mean, I can give uh, a very uh, uh, very stark example. Today, before I came here, I was actually dealing with the fact that uh, for some reason down where, where our home is at Locust and uh, Grove Avenue now, uh, near the old Martha Jefferson Hospital, and there's been for some reason a, a sort of a semi-crime wave there, burglaries and break-ins in the last couple of weeks. And, so the neighbors are very much on edge, and they noticed a couple of our guys walking around the neighborhood, so they called the police over the weekend. And so we get three police cars and paddy wagons showing up and challenging the guys, not totally inappropriate from their standpoint, but you know they didn't appreciate it very much, the fact that they do look a little different, I guess, period, they're, they're military, um, and that they are you know traveling together just back and forth from our houses. And uh, so I called my friend in the police department this morning, and, and we're going to be doing some education and, and awareness training with them. I'm already a, actually a crisis intervention team instructor, which is a course that the local police does, do, uh, does to educate um, the law enforcement officers about the, uh, PTSD and, uh, versus uh, other problems that they may face in veterans in the community. As you know, probably 25% of, of uh, homeless people are veterans. But, but again, I just want to thank you very much for, uh, you know, for such comprehensive and detailed work and, and actually getting it out in a different way. I think that, that you're going to reach people that otherwise wouldn't be reached. And uh, again, just uh, as recent as, as the past few days, I'm sure people have heard about the soldier that um, came out and shot up a bunch of Afghan uh, people, and that's just another tragic story. Multiple deployments increase PTSD. It's a high risk factor for it. So, um, 
you know, the more awareness we can have, the more we can support people in the community, the more we can understand that we can really break down the barriers that exist. Um, these guys do tend to isolate themselves, as you say, and uh, so the more that we can understand and support and recognize it, uh, you know, the better. So thank you very much for, for your efforts and your work. I'd like to say one other thing to the gentleman who, who asked me the question about uh, how we, we came to this. Uh, Dr. Ray Constable uh, is uh, really heading up these efforts with the dean, and I'm helping to implement some of that. So he would be someone to talk to about these issues if you'd like to. My name is Catherine Reynolds. I'm a speech pathologist. I, don't, I haven't worked with veterans of this war. I worked um, in some of my um, student days at the VA in Buffalo, New York, with some vets who've been, I think, from Vietnam. It's a long time ago. But um, what I wanted to say, Mr. Heyman, is, is thank you for your courage and bravery to be so stark, to say the horrible words, to give the horrendous and horrific descriptions of what um, these young men and women have been through. Um, I don't know anyone personally who's in, been in the military, but I have some friends who've had relatives who've seen horrendous things and come home afraid, they're isolating themselves because they're afraid of what they might do to others. They're afraid of their own temper. They're afraid of how they, you know, fight their own wife off in the middle of the night when they're having dreams. Um, and one thing that I, I was wondering, Dr. Barr, so, so many of these people are having multiple, even if it's mild head injuries, multiple blast and, and whatever head injuries, plus the stress and trauma of it, and they're back there. So is there an argument? I don't know how you would assess this, but certainly frontal brain damage, lacking inhibition, being inappropriate emotionally and sexually, is there a way? I don't know, does the military have a process for assessing these people? I know you have your sideline for footballers. <laughs> test. Right. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, yes, the military actually, I have to say, is, is uh, uh, very responsive to the issue of concussive, subconcussive blows, multiple concussive blows. Uh, they do have a, a system in place to assess people in the field. And in fact, now, um, over this past year, even if you were within um, 50 meters of a blast, uh, you are automatically evaluated um, when you get back to your forward operating base. Uh, and that, that evaluation is a, a, essentially a checklist for your symptoms and the use of what um, we actually use on the sidelines, the SAC, the Standardized Assessment of Concussion. They've made it into a military version that asks specific military questions. And it's basically a, a, a more complicated mental status examination. Uh, to determine if the person is, uh, uh, in fact, does have some cognitive compromise. Um, so, and any time you are determined to have had a concussion, and that's just been diagnosed, and this can be diagnosed at the medic level, it doesn't need to go to a physician there, they are automatically held out of any activity for two days. Uh, so you have that period of time, and if the person's um, uh, concussive symptoms have have uh, resolved at that point, they are then allowed to go back into, um, uh, into uh, their, their duties. Um, this also can be uh, evaluated through uh, relatively quick neurocognitive assessments as well. And those are available in some of them, not necessarily the forward operating basis, but the next level of, of care back. So uh, they're, they're pretty, pretty good about that. Unfortunately, you get a lot of folks with these uh, concussive blows and they end up back here and they still have problems. Some of these are lasting problems just like we have in our, our sports uh, communities. And uh, they end up over at uh, Dr. Neidifer's uh, operation and, and other places like that to help work on cognitive mm -hmm. remediation um, and then deal with the, the subsequent PTSD that happens there as well. By the way, their, their center over there is, is set up to um, help people get back into work. It's a vocational rehabilitation program, a reentry program that is uh, really pretty um, uh, impressive. Marcia Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. Um, this is a question for Daniel. The um, 
striking thing for me seeing your um, the torture victims' portraits, and um, and particularly the the young Corey, the young Corey woman, um, her her narrative. I'm very intrigued with how you've arranged, chosen to arrange the narrative on the canvas or on the plate. Um, I noticed that um, Damien's portrait is the the writing is pretty much in straight in straight lines like an ordinary text. But for these others, what's going? What are you trying to do to us to, as readers, <laughs> <laughs> giving us the stories in this form? Well. Um, this is my later, and her story. I mean, they all kind of come. Out, they kind of. They're all surrealist, and when they tell them that you just can't believe it. My later was trained as a, a criminal investigator within the military, and she was raped by the, her trainer in the military in her criminal investigation training, and knew that there was no reason for her to report this because, having been trained in the criminal investigation units, she knew that the rape reported and never went anywhere. So she didn't report it. And um, two years later, the rapist had gone on and raped a series of other military women, also none of whom ever reported it, but raped uh, a policewoman outside the military who didn't have that kind of cultural mindset, who did report it. An investigation started, and eventually they got back to Myla. And at that point, Myla, um, uh, you know, talked about it. Anyway, it's just one story, but it's such a bizarre story. And I just think that the writing should be bizarre. You know, it's not, not bizarre, but it's not an easy story. It's a complicated story, and, and it's not dismissible. But it's very torturous to tell it. It's, it's torturous to have somebody who's working for us live it, you know, especially when this is such a known issue in the military, the 3,000 rapes. Uh, reported every year in the military, and I think that's about 10 that 10 percent of the rapes that are actually occurring in the military. You know, I mean, it's not an unknown thing. So we're still asking women to go into the military and suffer this, and so it should not be so, something that you can come to really easily and read. I mean, that's that. This one was, you know, this was, this is completely torturous. But you know, what happened to her was crazy. So, yeah. Uh, you look like a visual artist in kind of the same level of psychiatry and psychologists uh, have, is that when you look at an individual, you can't determine uh, what's going on. The, the brain you cannot look at and say, oh, this is you know, a, a, a damaged, affected brain. In the same way, you look at your subjects and uh, I'm, I'm sure that most of the subject's uh, outward appearance is fine, but the story that's within has to be put out. You, rather than depicting the actual gruesome assault, you add the words in, and uh, that's the way psychiatry works. Right. Through the words. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 just to add to that, um, I didn't want to illustrate it. That also kind of seemed too easy. I wanted to take your brain as a, into that brain and kind of somehow live it or picture it yourself or, you know, I don't know if that's how psychiatry works. Well, well actually, the, 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 um, the only real uh, interventions that are effective for post-traumatic stress disorder are a telling and a retelling and a retelling of the same story. It's all exposure. Every, everything works has an exposure basis to it. So we work in the same way of looking at those words, hearing those words, processing those words. Um, and. Uh, Hopefully, the initial impact that we see in your work is not re experienced by the individual after those repeated talents. Yeah. By the time they, they agree to talk to me, they have tell, talked to so many lawyers and journalists and things, usually. So. I'm Dina Hurwitz. I work uh, <clears throat> at the Law School with Human Rights Program. Um, and I also want to thank you, Marcia, um, for bringing Daniel back, and thank you for your for your great work. Um, I just want to um, reiterate how important it is that you're focusing on uh, sexual assault victims uh, in the military. Um, and also, I think, in the context of the work that you do on um, <coughs> torture survivors and on the detainees from Abu Ghraib, because um, as we see here, I mean, th there's, there's Plenty of, maybe not enough, but there was discussion about PTSD uh, among returning vets. 
and there's concern, uh, you know, there's outrage about the treatment of torture victims. Um, but, you know, you, you, as you said, Daniel, the, the situation is, uh, is horrific and terrible and unbelievable, but it's also unbelievably common for uh, sexual assault victims in the military. Um, I, I don't know if, uh, well, I wanted to mention an organization called um, SWAN, um, Sur uh, Service Women's Action Network, and I think that they're involved in the case with Susan Burke. Um, but uh, this is an organization that was started by a uh, former um, Marine, I believe, a, a group of uh, women who have been trying to publicize the, this, this horrible phenomenon that, and its commonality or its commonness. And um, they finally, after the study has gotten going and, and are getting a lot more attention, they were part of the congressional um, uh, testimony that, that happened. Um, so I just I think it's it's extremely important, and I think it's very interesting to do it in the context of the Iraqi uh, war victims. Yeah. Well, can I just address that for one second? When I was doing the Iraqi uh, torture victims, many times I got asked, well, "What about the other side of the story? What about the Americans? Why don't you you know you don't you never tell their side of the story?" So I started investigating vets, you know. I mean, I'm not going to tell Charles Grainer's story, but, you know, this is the other side of the story. There are many other sides to the story, and unfortunately we're out of time. Um, but I hope some of you will come down, take a look, a closer look at the portrait, um, talk to Daniel. There, you can also see some of the um, other portraits from the catalog from the um, Bearing Witness exhibit. Um, please join us on Wednesday, 12.30, in this same room for a program called What Do You Mean He's Dying? Um, and there's a long subtitle, which I'm uh, Human Mortality, um, The Goals of Medicine, and uh, A Taxonomy of Serious Illness. Uh, we'll have Leslie Blackhall, palliative care physician here, to talk through the difficulties around end-of-life care. So now please join me in thanking Daniel Heyman and Jeffrey Fox.